Good morning. We are in the midst of our series, Flourish, and it comes on the heels of Pastor Brady sharing a letter to the church modeled after the letters that we read in the book of Revelation. As we talked about this, uh, this letter, we heard about a bone-rattling God, a God who doesn't just make bad things good, he brings dead things to life. He speaks life into weariness. We celebrated the beautiful things that are happening here and the foundation that's being built. We were challenged in areas that we need to grow and maybe set aside our own preferences for the good of those around us. We were invited to commit worship, to commit to ministry, and to commit to a group. And that's where we're going to spend a little bit of time today. Pastor Brady put on his scientist coat or his farmer's overalls last week to teach us a little bit about cross-pollination. If you missed that or missed the letter, all of those are online. I encourage you to watch them. They're available. But here's a recap of what we learned. In the world of fruit trees, there's a phenomenon called cross-pollination. A fruit tree will only flower but not produce fruit unless it is planted in community with trees of other species and types. In other words, there's a limit to the fruit tree's production unless it benefits from others planted nearby. Our growth in Christ is much the same. There's a limit to our faith development outside community. We need to be planted near others to fully develop in our faith. And so... These ideas that he, he gave in there also tie directly to John 15, which is where we're going to spend some time today. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 15. Maybe it's on your phone or we'll have it here on the screens. But I want to give you a little bit of context. See, this, this part, chapter 15, comes on the heels of a conversa conversation that Jesus has been having with his disciples. They, they spent the Last Supper together. They've celebrated Passover. And as part of that, Jesus has instituted a new meaning to that, which we still celebrate today, the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. He's, he's talked about that. He's washed his disciples' feet. He's predicted his betrayal and comforted his disciples. He talks about his relationship with the Father and tells them that he's going to be going away, but that's for their good. Because when he goes away, he will send an advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help them. And then we pick up here in chapter 15, where Jesus is talking about himself. He says, I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear my fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. 
And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. All right. So I need you to put on some shoes that you don't mind getting dirty. Because we're going to take a walk through the vineyard today. You got them on? I've never been to uh, the Holy Land or Napa Valley, but a picture can take us there pretty quickly. As we walk through the vineyard, we see a gardener. He examines not just every vine, every branch, but every single cluster of grapes. Not just once, but two or three or even four times. That's the kind of tender, loving care that gardeners give their attention to these plants. We also see intentional pruning. See, there might be two vines that are really close to each other that look really similar. These branches, they're there, but they need very different pruning. And that pruning that happens makes the growth possible. As we stroll, we might pick off a grape here and there, pop it in our mouth. What we would find is the best grapes are produced closest to the central vine. It's because they're closest to the nutrients that are most concentrated. And if there was a spot that was overlooked, thick vines growing together, attaching themselves to each other and all kinds of things around them, it's one big, uncontrolled, tangled mess. That's, that's a lot like life, right? If we stay close to Jesus, close to the vine, we're a little sweeter. Patience and kindness comes out of us. When we're surrendered to God, no longer slaves to sin, these things are natural results of that. Not just choices that we have to choose, but because we're close to the vine, it's a natural outgrowth in reality. Uncontrollable messes can kind of be that way too. When we get far away from the vine and just grow and do our own thing, attaching to whatever we want, whether that's work or relationships or pleasure, uh, Frank Sinatra, I saw this quote this week that said, I'm for anything that will get you through the night, be it prayer pills or a bottle of Jack Daniels. When we get far from the true vine, we start wrapping around whatever. We try to go our own way and avoid God's correction or the fellowship of community, and life can quickly become one big tangled mess. I long thought that John 15 was just about abiding. All about us remaining in God. And that's, that's true, but there's a lot of beauty. This is a multifaceted piece of scripture. Did you catch that part where he talks about my relationship, Jesus' relationship to God the Father? He talks about his relationship to us our relationship to the gardener, our relationship to the vine Jesus, and our relationship with each other. One theologian said, the basic imagery of this passage emphasizes the communal and relational nature of the Christian faith. The communal and relational nature of the Christian faith. So what about those grapes and branches? In her book, Fashion Me a People, Maria Harris pointedly states, a solitary Christian is no Christian. We come to God together or we do not come at all. See, the church, the family of faith, is meant to reflect the God we serve. God in three persons, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who serve and submit to one another in this beautiful relationship. And we get to mirror and echo that community. Have you ever seen this done really well? My dad's family, um, when we would gather together, usually in my grandpa's house in Drumright, 
We'd be over there and we'd have a meal. And it's a wonder that we ever ate, not because there wasn't food. We've got some great cooks. The, the little kitchen would be filled with stuff. But we'd pray, and it was almost as if then everyone went. And anyone would say, well, you go. No, you go. No, you go. They'd almost be like annoyed if someone said, well, you go first. I'm not going for you go first. My dad was the king of the no you go. Church potlucks, this is no joke. Not only would he make sure that everyone had gone through once, but if there were people who wanted seconds, dad wasn't in line until everybody got him. It was after everything died down that then my dad would go and get something to eat. No, after you, after you. What if we took seriously the opportunity to model and experience that kind of care and community? One that doesn't have to say, me first, because we're already looking out for one another. John Wesley, uh, a father and pioneer in our tradition, made these structured gatherings called class meetings. They were small groups of 10 to 12 people who met together weekly face-to-face. They focused on personal accountability, behavioral change, leadership training, and the transformation of their communities. What if we rediscovered some of those ideas? What if we discovered the New Testament's wisdom which urges bearing one another's burdens? of confronting, correcting, encouraging, exhorting, comforting, and edifying one another, of provoking, or as Pastor Brady shared last week, of spurring one another on to love and good works, of confessing our faults one to another, of weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice, of sharing the same love and unity that Jesus shares with his Father. Pastor Brady hit on this idea of one anothering last week, and I loved the words that he used to describe it. He said, it's mutual and reciprocal. And even though this idea of one another shows up over and over again, I like calling it one anothering. One anothering. The last verse in our passage today said, Jesus commands us to love each other, or other translations say, love one another. The New Testament is filled with one another commands. Love one another, live in harmony with one another, wash one another's feet, serve one another, carry each other's burdens, forgive one another, confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Aaron Nequist, a pastor and author, says this about it. He says, it's challenging when you realize that almost none of the commands can be fully obeyed in the traditional church gathering. If we desire to live in the way of Jesus, we need to expand our worship from being shoulder to shoulder, sitting in an auditorium or sanctuary, facing a stage or pulpit, to being face to face. Now, I want to be clear here. We value the gathering. There is something important and wonderful and beautiful that happens when we gather together, when we celebrate and worship and remember and hear the word of God proclaimed. We value that. But to one another well, mutually and reciprocally, it will require us to expand our worship That same pastor goes on to say, one way we grow in Christ-likeness is to have the courage to ask ourselves and one another, in what areas do we need to keep working? And while these can be named while attending a church service, they can only be lived and fleshed out in community, which works best in smaller groups. My experience with groups uh, ranges from lackluster and mediocre to to pretty phenomenal, actually. That happens. We have different experiences. Some groups are better fits than others. Some groups connect us with people with whom we will travel for a lifetime and some that we'll just travel with for that season. And that's okay. There's beauty in all of those. 
I know some friends who they, with their small group, they became like family and they spend holidays together and vacation together. It's what they do. My, my first group at my last church was um, a, a women's group. We had ladies of all ages. I was probably the youngest and it ranged on up. And I, I didn't make any super close friends in that group, but I did grow. And I did get to know some more friendly faces for the weekend. It was nice. One of the best groups I was ever a part of was primarily two newlywed couples. I started to say young newlywed couples, but they weren't quite as young as some newlywed couples are. But they were newlyweds, and it was them and me. And then over the course of multiple sessions of groups, other people were in and out. But the five of us traveled pretty closely together. Now, one of the things that bound us so closely as a group was that we were all far from family. None of us had family in the area or, frankly, in the country. We were there. And um, one week, the, the couple, the, one of the couples, shared the news that they were pregnant. And we were giddy <laughs> with excitement. And they said, it's still really, really early on, but we just, we want to tell some people, we've told our families back home, but we were told, it, go ahead and tell a couple of the people who are really close to you in case something happens, you'll want that support and it's just easier if they know. And sure enough, that's what happened. Just a few weeks later, where we had sat with that giddy excitement, we sat in silence, we sat and wept, and we sat and prayed because that baby only had half a heart. There was talk about in utero surgery and what's going to happen and how will this play out, and it was scary and terrible, frankly. The months weren't joyously expectant. They were stressful and difficult, but we walked them together. My moments of levity were to every time I walked in and saw the mama with her permission, I would grab the, the belly and I'd say, hello, baby. We said that when she came out, she knew my voice, but I'd have to say it like this, otherwise she wouldn't recognize it. Hello, baby. Her daddy and I painted her whole room milka purple, a real bright purple, just a few days before she was born, while her mama took a nap. Fast forward, she'll be 11 in May. She has two younger siblings. She survived multiple major surgeries, and I got to spend some time with them last year. We practiced and learned to rejoice and mourn together. We, we practiced carrying each other's burdens. The three of us ladies who were in that group live in various parts of the world, but we still talk regularly, and the other woman is now a mom too. When we get together, that 11-year-old likes to cook with the other mom. I didn't realize it, but there's a lot of talk of vineyards in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, much more than I remembered. And in Proverbs 31, it tells about the wife of noble character. Verse 16 says, she considers a field and by out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Do you remember putting on our shoes that can get dirty? That same master vintner had this to say about that verse. Anyone who plants a vineyard is looking ahead to the future. She has the foresight to know that it's going to be three or four years before she sees any fruit, both literal and figurative, from her labor. But she also knows that for 50 years after that, she and her family are going to get fruit. And even if it's not for wine, she's still thinking long term. If you're only thinking for the here and now, you'd plant a different crop. I think that's true of groups, too. Sometimes the payoff is pretty immediate. But more often, what happens is you gain more over time. Life gets richer over time. It's that way for those friends that I just talked about. There were no kids when we met 
and now there's five. And even across miles and oceans, we're invested in each other's families because of the investment we made in that group. Last week, Pastor Brady shared about his sister's funeral and who, who showed up, the people who rallied around him. The same was true about my dad's funeral. The people who showed up to pack up my house and get it loaded when I had to get home to dad, those were people that I'd been in groups with and people that I'd served alongside. And the people who flew and drove over 500 miles to attend dad's funeral to give me a hug, those were the people that I'd served with and the people that I'd been in groups with. Groups matter. One anothering in practice and imperfect execution matters. Practicing forgiveness and kindness and bearing one another's burdens mutually and reciprocally matters. Jesus said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And so, friends, today I wonder, how's your one anothering going? How's it going? I also wonder, who, who is spurring you on? Where are you planted? How does your life mirror or echo the community of our triune, good, wonderful God? Are you flourishing? Let's pray. Lord, you are good and your mercies endure forever. God, we thank you for this gift of community which you model so beautifully within yourself. Lord, I ask that you would give us the courage to ask ourselves how well we're one anothering and to take steps in relationship to take steps in obedience towards you, to practice these things, even imperfectly, mutually, and reciprocally for our good and for your glory. God, for the things that you want to do in this place, for the beautiful things that are happening, for the foundation that's being built, and for the promise that you are the bone-rattling God, would you help us to step into your invitation? to participate in the worship gathering, to be a part of groups, whatever that looks like for our schedule and in this season of life. Would you open up doors and knock on our hearts to invite us in to a place of service? God, that our relationship with you would be more rich and deep and sweet. And from the outflow of that, that our relationship with others would be sweeter too. God, may we remain close to the true vine. May the outpouring of that be sweet and fragrant. God, help us to flourish. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.